Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of the motion to borrow US 6 million from the African <coughs> Export Import Bank to finance the construction <coughs> of social infrastructure and other facilities damaged or destroyed by Tropical Storm Brett under an education rehabilitation climate link facility. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, before I delve into <coughs> my presentation on the motion, I crave your indulgence and that of <coughs> members of the House to express something I should have done earlier this morning to express get well wishes to Denver Edgar, a former student of mine, a friend, a constituent of Grand River, who was involved in a motor vehicular accident a few days ago. He sustained injury, Mr. Speaker. He is currently hospitalized, and we are hopeful that he will make a full recovery. And I must say, Mr. Speaker, with the consent of his family, the hospital has been in a position to apprise me daily on his progress. And as I said, I'm extremely confident that Denver will pull through <clears throat> and he will lead a very normal life in Grand Ravine and by extension, the Mabuya Valley. So I wish him well. Mr. Speaker, this motion is yet another demonstration of our government's commitment to the education of the nation's children. For a very long time now, Mr. Speaker, principals, teachers, students, parents, and other stakeholders in the education system have been clamoring for better conditions as it relates to school infrastructure. And whereas governments have tried over the years through various programs, particularly those funded by the CDB, namely BIP, BIP, more recently EQUIP, which is the Education Quality Improvement Project, and Mr. Speaker, as we speak, there is a proposal <coughs> being put together by the Ministry of Education in collaboration with the Department of Finance to submit to the CDB for funding to help us improve our education system. Mr. Speaker, the government of St. Lucia is seeking to, <coughs> or has secured 6 million US, which translates roughly into 16 million EC to support the Ministry of Education to support its infrastructure rehabilitation program. Over the past years, much of the annual budget for infrastructure works was directed to minor infrastructure repairs posing health and safety issues, including plumbing, minor electrical repairs, mold replacing, mold, sorry, Mr. Speaker, replacing termite infested ceilings, cupboard furniture, etc. Our budgets have not been able to facilitate major infrastructure rehabilitation. And with the average amount over the years of $5 million EC dollars, Mr. Speaker, given the number of schools we have in this country, it has proven over time to be insufficient to meet the demands as far as school rehabilitation is concerned. As an island frequently impacted by severe weather events, many of our schools continue to be impacted year after year. And in very recent times, Mr. Speaker, through the passage of Tropical Storm Brett, a number of schools were impacted and we had to find monies overnight to begin the rehabilitation of the damaged buildings to give our children um, a safe environment within which to engage in learning exercises. This has been exacerbated, Mr. Speaker, <coughs> by a number of other factors. We have sea blast, and we have the recent onset of Sargassum seaweed. The engineers and technical people are telling us that the presence of Sargassum in the base, Mr. Speaker, that too is having an adverse impact on school infrastructure, particularly the electricals. Many of the wooden structures, Mr. Speaker, compounded by age and aforementioned factors have been deemed irreparable and they need total reconstruction. Other peripheral school infrastructures such as, walls, such as walls and fences continue to be impacted and need attention, especially considering the growing concern of school safety and security. Mr. Speaker, the Philip JPL-led administration or the member for Castries East, his administration has been listening, Mr. Speaker, and has been exploring sources of revenue slash finance to support our schools. Thus, the US 6 million or EC 
credit from the Afri Exim Bank will go a long way in undertaking some of the major infrastructural reconstruction needed at our schools. Mr. Speaker, 16 schools have been detailed in the document that informed this particular loan agreement, Mr. Speaker. The upgrades will be undertaken using modern building codes and will utilize climate resilient and energy um, efficient technology. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> we need a lot more than 16 million to get our schools to where we want them to be. <clears throat> but in the context of what I have said and the presentation made by the Prime Minister in his preamble, Mr. Speaker, this amount will go a very, very long way in ameliorating the conditions at some of the schools that I will mention in a short while. We have more than 100 schools in this country. I have visited, Mr. Speaker, all but seven schools ever since I became the Minister of Education. And I can tell you every single one of the 100 plus schools, including early childhood centers, needs some form of work, some form of repair. But Mr. Speaker, we have decided in the context of what is available to look at the more critical ones, Mr. Speaker. Those where we cannot afford to continue for much longer before an intervention was made. And the schools that were selected, Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> were not selected because of where in the country they happen to be. But the plant and equipment unit within the Ministry of Education, they were very deliberate and very objective in singling out some of the schools that they believe um, have the worst conditions and are in need of most repair. Mr. Speaker, let me just mention a few of those schools. And I start with the Entrepo Secondary School. The Entrepo Secondary School, Mr. Speaker, was constructed in 1972, long before I was even born, Mr. Speaker. And the Entrepo Secondary School was one of several junior secondary schools constructed in St. Lucia at the time. And from 1972 to today, Mr. Speaker, every one of the junior secondary schools as we knew them, Mikud, Denry Junior Secondary, Corinth, um, it used to be Viewfort Junior Secondary at one time, Entrepo, etc. Every single one has been upgraded, Mr. Speaker, to a full-fledged senior secondary school. And with that upgrade came significant investments in the infrastructure at those schools. And to date, Mr. Speaker, the Entrepo Secondary School is the only secondary school where you still have remnants of the physical infrastructure that was first laid in 1972. So, Mr. Speaker, when I visit the Entrepo Secondary School and I engage with Mr. Arthur Scott, the hardworking principal, and he continues, Mr. Speaker, to ask for interventions from the Ministry of Education, Mr. Speaker, I can understand precisely what his fears are and why we should have made an intervention at that particular school. Mr. Speaker, we will, at the Entrepo Secondary School, be knocking down an existing block which poses a threat to students as well as staff, given that the building, Mr. Speaker, has outlived its usefulness, having been constructed in 1972 and still serves a school with a population of almost 500 children. Mr. Speaker, we will construct a three-story structure housing five classrooms, administrative offices, cafeteria, F and N lab, electricity lab, staff room, art room, sick bays, etc. And the Prime Minister made the point earlier, Mr. Deputy Speaker, when he said that we can no longer in 2023 mix concrete, mix cement, and just put down a structure. You must subscribe to international building codes. And whatever investment we make in the school plant, it must Mr. Speaker, align with the language of climate resilience. So, Mr. Speaker, I am extremely pleased to report here today to this um, honorable house that the Entrepo Secondary School will be rehabilitated to the tune of more than $5 million. And I will say again, Mr. Speaker, that the selection was influenced by the team at Plant and Equipment after having made their assessment of that particular school. 
Mr. Speaker, the Grand Riviere Secondary School in the constituency of Denry North is also down for rehabilitation. And this is one of several schools where timber structures are being replaced with concrete structures. The Grand Riviere Secondary School. And that school, Mr. Speaker, is one of the schools aimed as part of our TVET transformation. I would have pronounced in this house previously and elsewhere that four of our traditional secondary schools will be repurposed to be TVET specific um, institutions. There is a timber annex at the Grand Riviere Secondary School which is termite infested. And every year, in addition to having to procure materials to undergo um, rehabilitation and things of that sort, Mr. Speaker, we have to be spending thousands of dollars um, in pest control to treat the termite infested parts of that particular structure. It is not climate resilient, and we believe it has outlived its usefulness at the Grenivere Secondary School. And so that particular annex will be knocked down and a new block will be constructed. This school is also done as part of TVET, as I said, Mr. Speaker, and it will lead our TVET program in the area of sustainable agriculture and culinary arts. Mr. Speaker, the OJ Combined School has also been identified as one of the schools in need of serious rehabilitation. Mr. Speaker, we'll be spending an amount to undertake general repairs. That school has been in existence for many, many, many years, Mr. Speaker. And the, the structure, based on what I've observed and what has been communicated to me by parents and the technical team from the Ministry of Education, the school needs rehabilitation. This is one of our better performing schools in the south of the country, Mr. Speaker. The school has strong leadership, and it is a school of choice um, when you see students who reside in other parts of the south, the parents, Mr. Speaker, expressing a desire to have them enroll at the OJ Combined School. And so the OJ Combined School is down for major repairs under this amount. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, the Piero Combined School, also in the southern half of our country, is down for rehabilitation. With an enrollment of just, under two, just over 250 students, this is one of the schools nationally, not just in the Southern Belt, nationally, that punches way above its weight. This school is a model of consistency, Mr. Speaker. The school is extremely well led by a seasoned veteran educator in the person of Mrs. Mooney. And I visited the, the Peru Combined School, Mr. Speaker, all by myself to see firsthand the conditions about which they had been complaining. And I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, if the decision was mine alone to make, this would have been the first school down for rehabilitation. So today, I am happy to report to the Honorable House that the Peru Combined School is down for a new block where, Mr. Speaker, we will have additional classrooms and some of the amenities we believe will help the, enhance the learning environment for the students in that particular catchment area. The member of Yuford North, with whom I've had several bilaterals, is not here today, but I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, he too will welcome news that the Peru Combined School is down for rehabilitation, where an entire new block will be constructed to replace the termite-infested um, structure that currently exists um, at the Peru, in the Peru community. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> more schools to be looked at. We want to look at the reunion school in the constituency of Shuizel. And Mr. Speaker, that sits well with a point that was made earlier today, if not during the presentation of this motion by the Honorable Prime Minister, when he said that we do not look at the constituencies where work has to be done. We will always employ a doctrine of meritocracy. And if it is that the schools that need repair must all emanate from constituencies being represented by the opposition, we'll have no difficulty putting money in there to ensure we give the children of those constituencies the best possible educational experience our country can afford. afford. So the Hez Block, Mr. Speaker, which is out of commission at the Reunion School, will be looked at with major roof rehabilitation. We have to do a total um, overhauling, Mr. Speaker, of the electrical 
fixtures at that school, not to mention the plumbing issues and the other general um, matters of upkeep at the reunion school. So the principal, the staff, the students, and I'm sure the parliamentary rep for Chosel will all welcome news that from the AFRI Exim quantum of 16 million EC dollars being borrowed by the government, the students and people of Reunion Chosel will benefit like their counterparts in other parts of the country where that money will be impacting. Mr. Speaker, I move to the plain view combined. As I indicated, I will not be mentioning every single school, but I've pulled out some where I believe the, the situation is dire and the situation is in need of urgent attention. The plain view combined school in Viewfort is also down for some work, Mr. Speaker. Two blocks to be replaced, but we can only undertake one at the moment. This is a very big school in the context of the numbers we see at our primary schools, with an enrollment of just over 470 students. This school has performed well historically, and Mr. Speaker, it continues to be a school of choice for parents in the South. I was there very recently with um, personnel from the Caribbean, from the FICES, that is the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, where we executed a project with them um, for rainwater harvesting to sensitize the students to sustainable ways of living, etc. So when I saw for myself, Mr. Speaker, it really reinforced in my mind some of the reports that I had received and some of the complaints that had been put forward by the parliamentary rep as it relates to the condition of the Plain View Combined School in Viewfort. They have an issue with dust, Mr. Speaker, and as I said, the dilapidated wooden structure, etc. All of this will soon be a thing of the past when we inject <clears throat> well over a million dollars for the construction of a new block at the Plainview Combined School. Mr. Speaker, the Viewfort Comprehensive Secondary School is a very special school on the national landscape. They are also down for major rehabilitation. And it is important that we give the Viewfort Comprehensive Secondary School all the support that we can, not just in terms of physical infrastructural upgrade, Mr. Speaker, but we have to support their programs. Very recently, our cabinet approved a recommendation from the Ministry of Education to have a second vice principal at the Viewfort Comprehensive Secondary School. Every secondary school in this country operates with a principal and a vice principal. But a case was made by the Ministry of Education to the cabinet to give the Viewfort Comprehensive a second vice principal to share the administrative workload. And that has become necessary, Mr. Speaker, because this is the only secondary school in the country where in addition to the CXC CSEC program, they have taken on the CXC KIP, or what at one time we referred to as the A-level program. So, Mr. Speaker, we are fully aware of the efforts of the principal, Mrs. Peter, and her staff at the Devote Comprehensive. And as I said, they are down for major repairs, work to be done, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, in the science lab, the roof, the science block, um, six classrooms have to be um, rehabilitated. We have to look at the water issue, the electrical issues at the school. And this is a place, Mr. Speaker, a campus, if you like, where on a daily basis, you have in excess of 1,000 persons, students, faculty, and salary um, coming through the gates of the Viewfort Comprehensive School so that it continues to be, to be the flagship learning institution in the South. It is a big school, and soon from today, I should be in a position to speak to the operationalization of the second vice principal who will be providing support to the existing leadership at the school. And very recently, Mr. Speaker, I noticed the deputy speaker um, has a smirk, Mr. Speaker, um, almost an expression of satisfaction of the pronouncements on Dufort Comprehensive, he himself being a uh, former student of that institution. Um, we will not delve into his performances uh, in and out of classroom, but Mr. Speaker, I think he has acquitted himself well and is proving to be a, a worthy ambassador of such a great school. In very recent times, Mr. Speaker, a few days ago, we would have been privy to the CAPE results or the CXC A-level equivalent. And you would have noticed that the Viewfort Comprehensive Secondary School registered more than impressive performances, not just when compared to their counterparts locally, but regionally. 
Mr. Speaker, regionally, in accounts, the Viewford Comprehensive Secondary School came first. Regionally, Mr. Speaker, in Entrepreneurship Unit 2, the Viewford Comprehensive Secondary School placed third. And I'm talking regionally, Mr. Speaker. Not just the Viewford Comprehensive being pit against the Entrebo Secondary or the St. Joseph's Convent, but regionally, whether it's the Arima Comprehensive School in Trinidad or Kingston High in Jamaica, but across the length and breadth of this Caribbean, where hundreds of thousands of young persons would have taken the same exams, the students of Viewford have demonstrated once again that they are up to the mark and they can hold their own against the very best in this region. In the area of green energy and literatures, in English literature, Mr. Speaker, the Viewford Comprehensive was amongst the top 10 regionally, as was the case in tourism, green engineering, and those other programs area. So those other program areas. So Mr. Speaker, they are down for rehabilitation to complement the, 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 the work that is doing, and a school like that will always get the full support of the minister, and by extension, the cabinet of ministers, so that they can continue to, as we say in the cabinet, press, press ahead and give their students a very good experience. Mr. Speaker, the last of the many schools that are down for rehabilitation, it would be remiss of me not to mention the Sufre Comprehensive Secondary School, um, Mr. Speaker, for major works. As I said, I am only singling out a few schools. I do not have the time to go through the entire list of the schools that will be impacted, but I must mention the Sufre Comprehensive Secondary School. Led by Ms. Combi, a very young and enthusiastic principal, of course, and with the support and encouragement of a very passionate parliamentary representative, the Prime Minister has seen the need, Mr. Speaker, to make resources available to the Ministry of Education to help with the rehabilitation of the Sufre Comprehensive Secondary School. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> the roof at the Sufre Comprehensive School needs a lot of work. There are sections of the Sufre Comprehensive School where we have no windows. And I will take the opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to say not just to the students of the Sufre Comprehensive, but the students, our secondary school students in particular, across the length and breadth of this country. Secondary school students are not toddlers. Secondary school students are not kindergartners. Secondary school students are of an age, Mr. Speaker, where they have understanding and where they must appreciate that they cannot vandalize the school infrastructure expecting the following term or year for the government to find resources to come and repair the damages. I have said to the principals, I have said to the district education officers, and on occasions when I've had to speak with students, I have said to them, Mr. Speaker, that if they are found vandalizing school property, not only will they and their parents have to raise the money to replace the damage infrastructure, but Mr. Speaker, they will be punished in ways that will cause them to respect and appreciate the efforts that the government is making. Mr. Speaker, this injection of 16 odd million is designed to help enhance the learning environment of students and schools across <coughs> the length and breadth of the country and to improve the quality and effectiveness of schools. But we know quality infrastructure is only one component of an effective school system or an effective education system. And with your indulgence, Mr. Speaker, I will profit the opportunity to outline or remind this honorable house of some of the interventions we are making in the broader spectrum of education to give our children an experience that will prepare them for life, not only in St. Lucia, but beyond the shores of our country. Infrastructure alone is not enough. And as I said, there is more to quality schools and quality education than the physical structures that house our teachers and our students. Mr. Speaker, some of the programs being ruled out and that are being complemented by this injection of money to rehabilitate the school plan include the One Laptop Per Child program. We have reinstated the One Laptop Per Child program, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> and as we speak today, every single child in the secondary school system of St. Lucia, whether he's at the Viewfort Comprehensive, 
He's at the Patricia, Patricia D. James Secondary. He's at the SDA Academy, or he's at the Boca Secondary, or the Clinton Mason Secondary, or the Stanley John Odlum Secondary. Every single child in our secondary school system today has a laptop computer to compliment the government of the St. Lucia Labour Party. And Mr. Speaker, I remember when we came in and we found a program of e-books fraught with all kinds of issues. And Mr. Speaker, at Thursday's launch, Mr. Deputy Speaker, of the e-content, you will hear from the technical staff themselves. The previous government had contracted an Indian company to provide them with what was known at the time as e-books. And this is what happened with the e-books, Mr. Speaker. Professionals from beyond the shores of St. Lucia came into this country, sat with our teachers and our professionals, engaged them in conversation, took all the submissions of our teachers, and they went and they packaged it and they presented it to our government at an astronomical amount. And Mr. Speaker, do you know that for every device and every child, the government of St. Lucia every year had to be paying license fees. And it means, Mr. Speaker, that millions of dollars, millions, being repatriated out of this country to a foreign company. Mr. Speaker, we did not waste time to halt that program. And we did not just take a position because politicians had spoken out against something which they believe was not in, in, in keeping with their own party philosophies. But we were instructed, we were encouraged, and I have the submissions from all the senior technical people of the Ministry of Education in my inbox. But I will not throw my staff under the bus and tell you who said what. But the staff was adamant that this initiative with the e-books did not come from the Ministry of Education. But instead, it was imposed on them, notwithstanding the shortcomings of that program that they would have identified prior to its introduction. You have animations, Mr. You have animations in, 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 in the content of accents that are foreign to our children. And they can't understand some of the content. I did not, I'm not the one saying it. This is the report that I got from the technical staff. But I can tell you since we shelved it, Mr. Speaker, not only have we saved millions of dollars that would have left this country in the form of license fees, but we have developed content. And Mr. Speaker, I must place on the record my appreciation and my gratitude to the staff of Kamdu for having embarked on a content development project. And on Thursday, all of the cabinet has, um, members, all of the members have been invited to be with us for a demonstration. And I'm sure anybody who's in attendance, Mr. Speaker, will be full of praise for the work that has been done by the curriculum development materials. Mr. Speaker, I happen to reach the waterfront on a particular morning, roughly a month and a half, two months ago. And I noticed boxes and boxes of what appeared to be books were being placed right downstairs on the ground floor of the NIC building. And I asked one of the, the, the junior staff at the ministry, what do you all have there? Where are you all going with this? He said, those are e-books, not e-books, but loan books that the previous administration had, had, had procured that are of no use, they cannot be repaired, and that they were on their way to Diglo to dump those devices. I immediately put a halt to that operation. And I said to them, Mr. Speaker, just to be cautious, so that somebody wouldn't say that a Labour Party government is vindictive <coughs> and we're wicked and we throw in devices that were procured by the previous administration. I ordered, I instructed, and it's not often that I flex ministerial muscle, but on that day, I instructed that devices were taken back upstairs on the food floor where they had been. I, yes, they're still there. I had the communications unit to take still shots and to take video clips, Mr. Speaker, of all of what was earmarked for disposal. And I wanted to make sure 
that in keeping with the procurement rules and, and asset disposal rules of government that somebody had signed off to say a competent authority that those devices were of no use to the children of this country. They are still there, Mr. Speaker. We have use for them. Not necessarily for use in the classroom, but I'm sure those devices will be used to substantiate the claims. It is one thing for us to come into the Honorable House as politicians, as parliamentarians, and to have our exchanges. But there are certain things I defer to the staff, or I concede to the staff, to pronounce in on, sorry, especially when I know it is a highly contentious political issue. Mr. Speaker, our students will have uploaded on their devices content developed by our own people content that is culturally relevant, content developed by people who understand their accent and whose accents they understand, content that where examples are used, those examples are within the experiential background of the children, Mr. Speaker, so that there will be no ambiguity when it comes to the learning exercise. And that is what we meant when we said we were going to reinstate the One Laptop Per Child program. And very significantly, the savings that we've been able to make by developing our own content, some of it is being channeled, Mr. Speaker, or redirected to help bolster our higher education program. Mr. Speaker, our government continues to pay facilities fees for <coughs> every single child in the primary and secondary public school system. And Mr. Speaker, you should see the expression of relief from the parents when they come to the constituency office. And if it is that some persons in here are comfortable referring to parents who are having difficulty making ends meet as mendicants, that is them. I represent a rural constituency, Mr. Speaker. I know what it is like for parents not being able to buy a pound of fish when they hear the sound of that horn as the van goes through the community. I know first then, Mr. Speaker, what it is like when you're not able to buy a loaf of bread to ensure that tomorrow morning at 5 and 6 o'clock you can wake up and give your children breakfast, Mr. Speaker. So that when the government takes a decision to waive facilities fees for these children, Mr. Speaker, I know what the dollar circulation can do, particularly in the rural pockets. So those who want to criticize can criticize it. But I can tell you this particular intervention by our administration has found favor, particularly with those persons whose circumstances in life are not, Mr. Speaker, as, as, as bright as they would want it to be. Ours is still the government that is paying CXC, CSEC, mathematics, and English fees for our students in the primary, in the, in the secondary school system. And the Prime Minister is on the record, Mr. Speaker, as saying that it is, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that during this term of government, he is hoping that he'll be in a position where he will pay off mathematics and English and three other subjects for the children of our country. Mr. Speaker, we do so because we understand the plight of ordinary people. Mr. Speaker, we do so because we place a premium on education. Mr. Speaker, we do so because we are the genuine champions of poor people. We are not cosmetic as it relates to advancing the plight of poor people. And Mr. Speaker, again, we are re reducing that financial burden on the parents who otherwise cannot do it for themselves. Mr. Speaker, there are scores, hundreds of parents <coughs> thousands of parents in this country when you sit and you engage them in conversation they will tell you about their own educational circumstances and how because their parents were poor notwithstanding they had the ability they could not have gone any further than just enrolling at school because it was mandatory no premium no value was placed on education at the level of the family and in some communities and I've said here before that I remember as a child growing up attending the Larissus primary school in the Mabuya Valley. When officials from the Ministry of Education visited the Lariso school and the other schools that were in the Denrinov area, there was this very unsavory label that was ascribed to the schools. Schools within the banana belt. And once you heard that the school was from the banana belt, you expected nothing good to come out of it in terms of academic performance. But today, Mr. Speaker, we have children from the Denry Basin who are in the top 10 
of the CPEA, which we knew as common entrance. We have come a long way, but education is a continuum. It is a journey that never ends. And so at every step of that journey, <coughs> with the support of the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Education will continue to discharge its duties and responsibilities to the families and children of our country. Mr. Speaker, we understand that in order for students to thrive, that the physical environment must be conducive, and we've spoken about that um, here today. The Prime Minister, in presenting the motion, did so. Likewise, my colleague from Castry Southeast, and I touched on it briefly. But for students to do well, in an environment that is pristine and conducive, you need teachers to be comfortable and teachers to be happy. Mr. Speaker, I have said to teachers before that we entered teaching at a time when it was a vocation. And it is still a vocation. A vocation is something you undertake, you join, you become a part of, where money is not the main consideration for becoming a part of it. But there's a conviction and there's a calling that you have that would influence you to be part of that movement. And teaching, Mr. Speaker, is a vocation. I taught for more than a decade at both the primary and secondary levels. And I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, a teacher's role is more than just imparting content and facilitating learning and lesson delivery in a classroom. Today's teacher, in addition to being a traditional teacher, you must be a counselor. You must be a parent. You must provide spiritual guidance. And there's so much more you've been called upon to do, particularly as the challenges in society um, evolve, so too must the role of the teachers. And what have we done, Mr. Speaker, as a token of appreciation to the teachers of this country? The Prime Minister, without hesitation, he found the resources to increase what in education we call the TME, the Teaching Materials Allowance, by $600, so that teachers, teachers who received the TME in the months of August and those who were temporarily in the month, temporary, Mr. Speaker, in the month of September, also took home $1,400 TMA. I've said it before, and I will repeat here today, Mr. Speaker. When teachers travel, particularly to the United States of America on a vacation, Mr. Speaker, within the first two weeks of landing on the U.S. mainland, half of their suitcases, Mr. Speaker, and perhaps maybe an entire suitcase would have been filled already with materials and aids to enhance the learning environment in the classrooms that they'll be returning to after the vacation period is over. And so, Mr. Speaker, I must place on the record once again our government's gratitude to the teachers of this country and to thank the SLTU, Mr. Speaker, for working with the government. We have not always been on the same page, Mr. Speaker, but we understand that the SLTU is an indispensable ally in this quest to give our children the best possible educational experience our country can afford. There will be differences of opinion on certain matters, but we have never as an administration <coughs> seen the SLTU as an adversary, but instead we have seen a very enthusiastic and at times passionate group of individuals giving expression to the plight of their membership. And so our administration, we stand ready to work with the SLTU to improve working conditions and to ensure that at every opportunity, their input would continue to influence policy for our government. Mr. Speaker, we have a pre-K program, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in our schools. And pre-K basically speaks to students coming into the formal school system before the age of five. Mr. Speaker, as we, 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 we know it historically, a child enters the formal school system at five. But we have excess space at a number of our primary schools because the population, the enrollment has dropped nationally significantly because St. Lucians, Mr. Speaker, are not procreating at the rate that they were known to have in times gone. I know that is not applicable to everybody in this chamber, particularly those to my immediate right, Mr. Speaker, but that notwithstanding, <laughs> that notwithstanding, Mr. Speaker, the pre-K program is an important program for us in the Ministry of Education. So at schools where we have excess space, we convert some of the classroom space 
into little centers within the school environment to bring in the pre-K. They are not part of the main school programming. They have their separate programs, Mr. Speaker, but that is how we begin to immerse them into the broader spectrum of, of, of school life at an early age. So far, Mr. Speaker, we have rolled out our pre-K program at six schools, namely the Sufra Infant School. Mr. Speaker, I was able to see for myself. The conditions are very, very impressive, and I'm hoping that as we continue to provide support to the pre-K program in Sufra, working closely with the OECS, um, that on occasions when the Ministry of Education isn't able to pick up the slack, we can rely on a very healthy and reliable um, Sufra Foundation to help in that regard. Mr. Speaker, not too far from Sufra, we go to the constituency of Chouazel. At Mogouj, perhaps the best pre-K setup I've seen in the country to date, <coughs> although my staff and I, we are always on a different wavelength for this concern. The setup at Mogouj, Mr. Speaker, is also very, very impressive, and there's a very healthy pre-K program at the Mogouj School. Bokaj Primary School also has a pre-K program. Bokaj is in the constituency of Castries East. And it wouldn't surprise me if the inclusion of Bokaj on this program is news to the Prime Minister. Um, and if anybody might be inclined to believe that the Prime Minister's influence was what, in, uh, was what um, caused Bokaj to be on the list, Mr. Speaker, no. Again, we employed the meritocracy. We did our research. And we know that there are some communities <coughs> where the, the early childhood services are not as robust as we want them to be. So once there is space within a particular catchment area at our primary school, we will look to um, have the pre-K program pick up the slack that the normal early childhood services cannot deal with. Lacroix Mango is also, Mr. Speaker, part of our early childhood um, pre-K program, as is <coughs> Denry Infant School and the Roblo. So these are the six schools that are currently enjoying or benefiting from the pre-K program. It is very instructive to note that there's none from Denry North, Mr. Speaker, because again, we have employed a meritocracy that informed the selection of those schools. The program will be expanded, and I'm hoping that the next time I speak on pre-K, perhaps at budget, I can speak to the inclusion of a lot more schools across the length and breadth of this country. Mr. Speaker, one of the flagship areas of programming for the Ministry of Education is <clears throat> our higher education mandate. <clears throat> we believe, Mr. Speaker, that we can, or it is realizable and attainable, to have one university graduate per household in this country. And we have spent no effort, Mr. Speaker, to go out there in a very aggressive way to source the scholarship and the higher educational opportunities for young St. Lucians. Mr. Speaker, very recently, for the first time this administration, we rolled out a program known as the UniPass. And the UniPass is a program that was specifically designed for St. Lucians who want to access university. The government, Mr. Speaker, and I must thank the Honorable Prime Minister, who is the Chief Custodian of the Public Purse, for making half a million dollars available for the UniPass, where average young St. Lucians who have started programs, but somewhere along the way, they have found themselves, Mr. Speaker, in difficulties that they cannot get out of. The government is saying to them through the UniPass, we have a facility where we can give a grant, the maximum of which is $10,000, to help them complete programs. In some cases, some of them just need the start, Mr. Speaker. They also qualify. We have entered into several programs with Monroe College as a country. But I've said it here, and the Prime Minister did say at a function that I um, attended with him that we have a responsibility to the University of the West Indies. We cannot continue to work with Monroe at the expense of the UWI. We will work with Monroe. <coughs> we will explore every opportunity to work collaboratively with Monroe College, but it should never be at the expense or to the detriment of the University of the West Indies. And Mrs. Mr. Speaker, I have no difficulty placing on the record that our government, we have a responsibility to UWE, University of the West Indies. Mr. Speaker, we have rolled out the first generation scholarship program. First generation. 
you have to be the first from your family to enroll at university. Too many young St. Lucians, Mr. Speaker, have become victims of the society because of their socio-economic background. Too many young St. Lucians demonstrated from kindergarten up to grade six that they were the best in the class. They demonstrated at the common entrance exam, now the CPE, that they were the best in the class. They transitioned to some of the best secondary schools. From form one to form five, they demonstrated that they were still the best. But once they had exited the doors of that secondary school, their parents had no land, there was no property to mortgage, there was nothing to help secure loans for higher education, and some of them had to languish. And they had to sit by and watch people whom they had dominated from kindergarten all the way to post-secondary. They had to sit by and watch those persons excel because their socio-economic circumstances allowed them to secure monies at banks at rates that their parents could have afforded to become the professionals they wanted to be. Our government has taken a decisive step to correct that wrong. So today, Mr. Speaker, when you go to Monroe College, where we have 100 first-generation students being financed by the government in collaboration with Monroe College, I invite you to do your background check. What parts of the country are they from? What is the story of their families and, 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 and their parents? And today, Mr. Speaker, they can take their rightful places at university and dream and live that dream of becoming the professionals that they want to be. Mr. Speaker, in addition to the first generation scholarship program, we have another scholarship program with Monroe College, which we found, we inherited when we came in, where Monroe College was providing 17 scholarships to young St. Lucians. Three full scholarships and 14 partial scholarships. Mr. Speaker, because we have been able to roll out so many programs and we've had that conversation with the nation as it relates to higher education, the young people of St. Lucia are coming forward in droves, Mr. Speaker, to want to access. For the 17 scholarships that are on offer to begin in the month of January, for the 17, Mr. Speaker, to date we have received in excess of 134 applications. Mr. Speaker, and the hardest part Gen of this for me. You have 15 minutes left. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, what is most disconcerting about all of this is when you have 130 applicants and I'm certain that out of the 130 applicants a good 115 or more they qualify and they meet the entry requirements but you can only facilitate 17. But Mr. Speaker the Minister of Finance I know given the passion that he has for education I'm sure in the ensuing budget will again let his creativity come to the fore and devise a mechanism that will cause us to increase the number of St. Lucians whom we are facilitating. Mr. Speaker, we have had increased numbers going to Taiwan. We have seen an increase in the number of students going to Hungary on, on scholarship. And Mr. Speaker, very recently, a cohort left for Morocco. I must place on the parliamentary record our government's appreciation for a gentleman who is of Grenadian parentage but resides in the U.S. in the person of Randy Glynn for the fantastic work he has been doing with Sir Arthur Lewis Community College and the government of St. Lucia and some other governments within the OECS in finding the scholarships and finding the schools in North America with which our governments and our flagship tertiary institutions can collaborate to provide opportunities for our young people. Mr. Speaker, we are not only catering for the marginalized and those persons whose socio-economic circumstances are not favorable. We are also saying to those in society who are capable of buttering their own bread that they too will not be left out. Our government, this Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, has made an arrangement with the St. Lucia Development Bank to secure, Mr. Speaker, 10 million EC dollars as a credit facility for St. Lucians who want to pay their way to university. So Mr. Speaker, this is just a snippet of what is happening in education. We will continue to roll out those programs. I do not want to make pronouncements in terms of what is coming in the ensuing year. I will leave that for the Prime Minister's 
appropriation bill address, Mr. Speaker, and some of the plans that will be in, unveiled in the new year. But today, Mr. Speaker, I am extremely delighted, I'm extremely pleased to be the minister responsible for education at a time when the government is saying that we have to continue investing in education. Mr. Speaker, we did not just embrace a mantra on the campaign trail because we believe it would have resonated with people. But we have demonstrated in every government department, in every agency and statutory entity that we believe putting people first is something practical. Today, we are putting the children of St. Lucia first. Today, we are putting the teachers of St. Lucia first. Today, we are putting the principals of this country first. And today, Mr. Speaker, with a loan of 16 million EC to rehabilitate schools, we are putting the people of St. Lucia first. Mr. Speaker, it would be remiss of me to take my seat and not express my gratitude as minister and that of the entire government <coughs> to the many persons who work in the education sector to help roll out the programs. I want to thank the Parliamentary Secretary for working with me, the Honorable Senator Dr. Pauline Antoine Prosper. I want to thank the Permanent Secretary, Ms. Michelle Charles, the Deputy Permanent Secretary, Mr. Kendall Kudra, the newly appointed Chief Education Officer, Ms. Beverly Diodoni, and all the other heads of departments, Mr. <coughs> Speaker, um, in the ministry. I want to thank the National Principals Association, Mr. Speaker, for their support. And again, I will say we have not always been on the same page as it relates to the issues. But the one thing I can assure you is that when we have our exchanges, the, the, the enthusiasm and the passion that, that, that informs the discussion is one that is born out of concern for the children of St. Lucia. I believe, Mr. Speaker, that we still, as a country, we continue to be a rich repository of academic talent. That has been proven for decades, um, not just locally and regionally, but St. Lucia has put some of the best men and women, best international professionals out there for the benefit of mankind. I know we can continue, Mr. Speaker, and we have to invest in our children to ensure, and as I said, we do not prepare them for life only in St. Lucia, but so that they can become global citizens, taking their rightful places in whatever part of the globe they decide to reside. <coughs> so, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to remercie the Premier Minister, and the Ministry of the Responsibility for Finance, to make the money to the ça c'est à peu près 16 millions de dollars qui est en école du ministre de l'Éducation fait travail en les plusieurs écoles qui ont des conditions qui pas tellement bon comme my et puis teacher ça 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 fait affaire yo comme ça my là ça apprend nous avons aussi dit là nous avons fait l'école neuf en tant aujourd'hui nous pas ça baptiser l'école ça en même manière nous avons bâti en tant qu'il passé parce que ça tellement nous pour dire les bail conseil qui climate change only hurricane ki pli fò e ki ni pou wè ki la te l'ekòl la ou ka bati a menm si hurricane vini be mauvais temps vini i pa ka y dommage si l'ekòl sa kon l'ekòl te ka tape dommage en tant ki passé Mr Speaker we will ensure quality workmanship in the construction period it will not be a case where we will just hand contracts to people. Contractors will not be selected based on political affiliation. But instead, contractors will be people who have proven over time that they have the requisite skills and experience to undertake the projects in the various magnitudes that will inform how we move forward. So, Mr. Speaker, once again, I want to thank the Honorable Prime Minister and the Minister for Finance for making the resources available. And I can give him the most solemn of assurances that under my stewardship and leadership, the <coughs> Ministry of Education will endeavor to make the best use of that money, thereby enhancing the learning environment for children whose dreams and aspirations we are committed to facilitating whilst we hold the reins of government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.